All right, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from today, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Nick from Business Review, and I'll be hosting today. It's our absolute pleasure to have with us SGD Pharma, who will be presenting the webinar titled Why Pharma Packaging Choice Matters in Protecting Children's Lives. Today's guest speakers are Najat Mabaki, Senior Product Manager, um, Dr. Rolf Abelman, Managing Director of IBM Child Safe, and Andrew Smith. Technical Packaging Director of GlaxoSmithKline. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar platform, which is on 24. Um, you'll notice that the platform is browser-based, so if any of you disconnect for any reason at all, please just click the link that you received by the email and it should rejoin the session. Or if you're encountering any problems at all, just refresh the browser and it should solve most issues. Um, in order to ask any questions at all, you can pop them in via the questions widget, which should be on the top right of your screen or alongside the bottom of your screen, and then just click Submit. Um, if you do need any help at all, please use the yellow Help widget inside the bottom of the screen. And if you require any assistance at all, you can move, resize, and maximize any of the windows in front of you also. But for now, please allow me to welcome the jet. Thank you, Nick. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. How long, ladies and gentlemen, would we accept the preventable accident of our beloved children? How long will we delay in our sector the full adoption of easy measures that could save lives? This is precisely the topic of this webinar. I am Najat Mebarki. I am Oral Product Manager at SGD Pharma, a glass leading packaging manufacturer for the pharmaceutical industry. And I'm delighted to share this session today with Andrew Smith from GSK and with Dr. Rolf Abelman from the IVM Child Sales Institute. So I will start by explaining this issue and what we are doing at SGD Pharma as a packaging manufacturer to address it. Then Andrew will explain the approach of a big pharma company and their commitment. And finally, uh, Rolf, the expert of child resistant packaging, will explain further what is behind the RC. We will end this session with a 15 minute uh, Q&A uh, session. So, uh, unfortunately, there are still too much deaths from injury when one third could be prevented. You can see on the left uh, the split by injury type and poisoning is still responsible for 4% of unintentional deaths at the global level. This percentage varies across regions and, for example, in Europe, it is still one of the three main causes representing 7%. Poisons can be inhaled, ingested, injected, or absorbed, but majority is ingested through oral route. Poisoning can be fatal, but as you can see on the right, non-fatal accidents are more numerous, and they are an important cause of long-lasting disability impacting the child and child, sorry, and its quality of life. When we know that more than 90% of this uh, accident could have been averted. So at SGD Pharma, we believe that as a packaging manufacturer, we have a role to play, and even more, we have a societal responsibility to end this issue. So the poisoning issue varies between region and within country, and 90% of poisoning happens in low and middle income country. However, today we will focus on Europe and US because poisonings are related to medicines and this is where we have a possibility to act as a packaging manufacturer. The drivers uh, of poisonings are numerous and the first one is the age and the gender. So as you can see on the left, majority of children um, impacted by these issues are under five years old and this is because children and toddlers are close to the ground, they are but orally oriented and also the small body mass makes them particularly susceptible. The nature of the poison, its formulation, the dose taken and the route of exposure is key. Then uh, the poison center and health uh, services infrastructure um, are also key because the rapidity of the response is a critical factor in saving lives. Also, majority of the accidents happen at home and when the product is being used. 
So children are particularly are at risk when harmful substances are not stored in uh, child-resistant containers. And again, 93% of deaths could be averted with the right packaging. So the data on the toxic agents are limited, but we know that the top three causes of poisoning are medicines, household products, and cosmetics. So I will focus on medicine poisoning. Um, so poison, medicine poisoning today is the top one cause in the United States and Europe, as still uh, 50, more than 50% of cases impact children under six years old and two thirds children under two years old. So it is also the case in UK, uh, where one quarter are in, involving analgesics. And if we look outside of Europe, we see that uh, the, the picture is similar, where more than 30% uh, also in Bangladesh, Colombia, or Egypt. And the main products um, that are responsible for uh, this issue are paracetamol or cough and cold medicines uh, in liquid, um, but also prescription medicine like antidepressants, but the main one remains uh, analgesic. So on the top of the tragedy caused by this issue, this issue is also costly for all stakeholders in terms of human cost, medical cost, or and corporate cost. So there is no global data on uh, the cost of intentional injury. And for example, in Europe, no study has been undertaken yet. But uh, we know that uh, in terms of human cost, for example, it impacts uh, the quality of life, whether it is the child's quality of life or the parent uh, with the risk to have an inability to work. In terms of uh, medical cost, poisoning and its management are costly. So we know that medical uh, treatment and its monitoring are extremely costly. For example, in US, it represents around 15% of medical spending. But also, there is a cost also for, a, there is a corporate cost as the most recent example was uh, in 2018 when Dr. Reddy Laboratories uh, had, uh, had a fine of $5 million uh, not because a child was impacted, but just because the packaging was not compliant. It was in US. And also on the top of the cost, it damaged uh, drastically um, the, the brand, the brand image. So there are the three key strategies to prevent this issue are first education, whether it is through parents, care providers, educators, public policy makers, and of course companies. Then engineering, and uh, this is about product design, and um, using child-resistant closure is among the most successful strategy and a legislative requirement in many countries. For example, in UK, uh, during the period of the 70s until now, UK experienced a fall of 80% of uh, poisoning deaths in children under 10 years old. In Netherlands, since CRC packaging is mandatory, and it is mandatory since the early 80s, they experienced a 50% decrease in hospital admission. And these results are largely attributed to the use of CRC packaging. So to highlight this example, this is uh, the situation in US when, where you can see the drastic reduction of uh, emergency room visits uh, within the years. So finally, um, what uh, we are doing also at uh, SGD Pharma to tackle this issue. We are tackling it in a different way, so first by product of, through product offering. So we have launched by mid-September a new uh, CRC packaging solution dedicated to the oral market. So that covers a wide range of applications, whether it is syrup bottles or dropper bottles, but also through uh, education by raising awareness, for example, by doing uh, a webinar like today, but also we have released in February a white paper dedicated to this issue uh, that I invite you also to download. And finally, uh, we will uh, release by end of year a new product related to this issue. So stay tuned, it's coming soon. So poisoning remains a leading cause of preventable childhood deaths, but um, 
it has been proven that TLC is the most successful solution to end this issue. And it's really about the last mile. And uh, I believe that uh, through collaboration and commitment from all the stakeholders, uh, we can make an impact. So thank you for watching this. I, I hope you find it useful and I look forward to hearing your questions. Now I hand over to Andrew, who will tell us about GSK commitment to tackle this issue. Thank you. Hi, thanks, uh, Najit. So, uh, as Najit said, so uh, my name is Andrew Smith. I've worked for GSK for uh, just over 27 years, uh, and I'm currently the technical packaging director for our pharma supply chain, and I'm currently based in the UK. So, at GSK, we recognised the role we can play in helping reduce serious harm resulting to children from unsupervised uh, access to medicines. Now, what we've subsequently done is we've kind of moved for our strategy from a simple uh, compliant strategy to now focusing on doing the right thing for our patients. So originally, child resistant packaging was implemented where legislation dictated. We then moved to a situation where we looked to introduce child-resistant packaging for our new products. And then subsequent to that, we, we've gone back and we've looked at our existing portfolio. Uh, and then where appropriate, we're, we're transitioning uh, those products into child-resistant senior-friendly packaging, so CRSF packaging. Now, what this has meant, this has meant that we've now implemented uh, CRSF packaging across 40 of our internal and external sites globally. Um, and as of 2020, uh, we don't actually record it anymore, but as of uh, quarter one 2020, we'd actually provided more than 200 million packs in channel resistant packaging. And that's 200 million packs um, in channel resistant packaging. Uh, that are not required by legislation. So that is part of GSK's strategy to uh, protect children. So as part of that, the kind of considerations that, that we as a pharma company had to look at and, and the challenges that, that, that we undertook was identifying which products should in fact be in child resistant packaging. Yeah. Uh, and of that, of that, as we started transitioning, or as we started to look at transitioning those products into child resistant packaging, what we had to do is, is look at the shelf life of the product and understand the stability implications of that product. Uh, and likewise, you know, if, if we're going to change the packaging materials, then we need to understand the changes in the registered details. And this becomes uh, far more prevalent if uh, it's a product that's a kind of a globally supplied product, especially if it's a globally supplied product from a single site. Now that site may have uh, multiple licenses for the same product. So the kind of coordination of those registered details across markets, it can be very problematic. The other thing to think about is actual the markets that are being supplied. So one of the things that we found is that, that some markets that are being supplied child resistant packaging have never seen anything like this before. So it's about educating the end users and educating those patients so that they can you know access the medicines that that that, that they need. So moving on to specifics so when we looked at oral solid dose uh, blister considerations now you know as you're probably aware many um, blister foil suppliers will offer child resistant lidding stock uh, and basically what, what that is it, it, it will be a, an aluminium lidding material with additional layers uh, so that then it becomes more difficult for that product to be pushed through the lidding material. Now, by making it more difficult, then the, the child doesn't get access. But also, by making it more difficult, you're more likely to damage a friable tablet 
or damage your capsule. So, you know, if your product is friable, then you may need to look at alternatives to uh, through materials. So you may need to go to something called a, a peel push blister. So this is where you would peel the layer, peel the top layer first, and then the product can simply be pushed through um, a simple aluminium lid stock. However, moving to things like peel push blisters, then you would need to consider perforations of the blister. Uh, and you know, routinely adding perforations means that you're going to increase the size of that blister. Other things to consider are if you're adding those additional layers to the lidding stock, then the um, the heat required to seal that blister is usually higher because you've got to get that heat transferred through those different layers to the actual sealing surface. So you need to assess whether the equipment that the blisters are going to be produced on can in fact handle that higher temperature. And the other thing that needs to be considered is the overall efficiency. So by increasing the thickness of the material because of those additional layers, what you will do is you will reduce the running meters, so the amount of blisters that can be produced per reel. So therefore, you will see more foil changes on that blister line. Yeah. And you know, I talked a little bit about local market requirements and about educating the end users. But the other thing to consider is, does the are there any local market restrictions in terms of the pack design? So the likes of Japan don't allow for cross perforations, so you can't have perforations in two directions within Japan. Now that then uh, makes a peel push blister much more difficult to design. And then the other consideration for blisters is if you are going to design a blister and implement a, a char resistant blister, you obviously need to get that tested. But you need placebo tablets. You cannot give um, you know, children blisters with active product and then ask them to see if they can access that product. So you need to consider that uh, the placebo need, the placebo requirements. And those placebo should be in the kind of market or very similar to the market image of the uh, actual product. Just looking at uh, bottles and, uh, and glass bottle considerations to start with. So, you know, assessing uh, the barrier properties, obviously, you know, glass is an impermeable material. <coughs> Excuse me. So, understanding the barrier properties of that uh, product inside the bottle. It, you, you really do need to understand that. And you know, the image on the screen, you've got a, a roll-on pilfer proof cap, so the, the one on the right, the aluminium cap, ROPP cap. Now those ROPP caps do provide an excellent moisture barrier uh, alongside the glass bottle. Now moving to a child resistant closure, you, you know, if you need that high barrier, high moisture barrier properties, the likelihood is you're going to have to induction seal onto that glass bottle. Now, induction sealing onto glass can be very problematic. Yeah. So, so you need to look at that. The the other thing is selecting the cap, the child resistant cap. So whether you go for a, a squeeze and turn or a push and turn cap. If you're going to a squeeze and turn, or if you know. Commercial decide, for, for instance, your, your commercial guys decide a squeeze and turn is much more preferable. Then what you'd need to do is think about the actual uh, bottleneck, so the, the the neck of the bottle. That would then need to be redesigned for the squeeze and turn design. As you can see also on the image on the screen, the actual overall pack height does change. So by introducing channel resistant closures, you may then impact your secondary and tertiary pack designs. So it may not just be a case of uh, the primary pack, you may in fact um, end up changing your primary, secondary and tertiary packaging. The other thing to consider is, especially if it's a, an oral liquid. So oral liquids can, uh, can routinely be dosed to children using a dosing syringe. That dosing syringe may use a bottle adapter to support the uh, 
the end user to support the, the kind of caregiver. Now, you need to consider what that adapter does in terms of the CR functionality of the cap. And what you may find is you may find that you have to test with and without that adapter in place. So, you know, by introducing that CRSF cap, you may find that you're testing twice. Um, other considerations, again, equipment. So, you know, uh, um, a roll on pilfer proof um, cap head will not be suitable for applying the uh, CR cap on, on the bottle. So, that there would be capital expenditure and changes to the equipment there. I've also included uh, tamper evidence. So, you can see on the aluminium cap there. The skirt, the, the the bottom of the cap, as you open it, that that kind of drops down uh, and demonstrates to the end user that the, the bottle has been opened. So if you need tamper evidence, you also need to think about how that tamper evidence will be uh, provided to the end user. And again, stability. The likelihood is uh, with glass bottles, if you're changing uh, the cap, and therefore the barrier properties, you are going to need to. Uh, that down stability to support that uh, regulatory change. For plastic bottles, it's um, relatively like for like. If you're going from a screw plastic screw cap to a, a plastic channel resistant cap, then a lot of the things remain the same. However, you would need to consider what type of cap you're going to use, squeeze and turn versus push and turn. Again, the overall pack height is likely to change. And again, if there's a use of adapters, you need to consider what uh, the introduction of that adapter does in terms of the CRSF functionality of the cap. So that, that was it, a very uh, short whistle of um, considerations and challenges for CRSF packing. So I will now hand over to Rolf, who will give you a bit more detail on the actual testing itself. Over to you, Rolf. Thank you, Andrew, and hello to everybody. Um, yes, just to introduce myself quickly, I'm Rolf Abelmann. I'm Managing Director of IBM ChildSafe. That is um, a market research and testing institute that is located in Braunschweig, Germany. Um, and we have a focus on testing and certification of child resistant packages. I will today also speak about uh, child resistant packaging solutions, its testings, and finally certification procedures. Mm. So, what is child resistant packaging? Uh, child resistant packaging has been designed to prevent young children under four to get access to the harmful content of a package. So it should be clear that these packages will never be 100% safe, as adults also have to be able to open them uh, quickly. The intention is also not to take uh, responsibility from parents or caregivers. It should be more a kind of a less barrier or help. So, so how does this technically work? Uh, the concepts of child-resistant packaging are either based on a trick to open or a material that is difficult to open. Uh, so you all know closures that work uh, according to the push and turn or the squeeze and turn principle. Um, and these principles work uh, as it is very difficult for young children to do two coordinated actions at the same time. Um, and there's also other concepts of child resistant packaging that combine strength and knowledge or that you have to do several steps one after the other to, to open the package. So let's check just some examples. Um, yeah, well, very well known are, of course, reclosable child resistant packages like closures and bottles. Um, you can open them, access the content, and finally reclose them in a child resistant manner. Here's some push turn closures shown. Uh, squeeze and turn, um, and in the middle we have one snap cap system. So we call it like that. You have to turn the closure, bring it into a certain position to be able to uh, lift the lid off. 
Mm. Further examples might be here on the right, we have a pill dispenser. You have to push one button and the second button afterwards, and afterward then after by this you're able to access uh, one pill or one tablet. Mm. Another possibility uh, down there, we have a child resistant box. There's three points you have to press simultaneously and then you can lift the lid. Um, and on the right beside there we have um, a child resistant outer cardboard box. There is a blister integrated. You have to open the lid then you can shift the blister to the side and only after this you're able to press out the tablet. Um, lots of the packages that are child resistant, are, but also are non-reclosable child resistant packages. So the units are packed individually and uh, most well known are of course child resistant tablet blisters. So uh, the principle is like that, that um, the care packaging can either be opened with force, uh, tools that are required for opening like scissors, or uh, several steps must be taken in a row, one after the other, to access the individually packed unit. Um, alternative solutions, packaging solutions are, for example, pouches, sachets, wallets, ampules, or vials, etc. cetera. Mm. resistant blister concepts, very well known are these two. So we can see on the left uh, uh, peel and push blister. The principle goes like that, that you have to first separate the single cavities. Then you have to remove a peel foil. And afterwards, uh, you can push the tablet through the remaining push foil. And on the right, we have a tear blister. Again, to get access to its content, we have to separate the single cavities, then we can access a certain perforation and by this tear off the cavity and remove the tablet inside. Um, more solutions are here, for example, child resistant sachet on the top. You can access the content by first removing the top of the sachet and then you can tear it down, get access by this or child resistant stick packs that have some kind of laser perforation where it's possible to open it. Or for example, also single dose tubes, vials, etc. Um, just to have some more idea of what child resistant packages could look like, here's a couple of them. Right in the middle, you can see um, a pouch where you have to first fold the corner, then you can access uh, perforation and using this here of the sachet or the pouch, otherwise this will not be possible because it has a very strong robust foil. Mm. Finally, we also have some combinations of reclosable and, and um, single dose units. Um, mostly you have to press a certain point at the outer box, then it's possible to pull out the blister and afterwards get access to its single packed units. Mm. Something about legislation. So we have in many countries laws that require the use of child resistant packaging. And at the same time, these laws also um, provide rules of how child resistant packaging should be designed, or let's say they ask for a standard to test them. So here's just a couple of laws that have been established in some countries or internationally. But uh, when, these, when these regulations ask for the usage of child resistant packaging, it always remains the question if the design package 
finally uh, will uh, prevent young children to access its content. And therefore, standards for child resistant packaging have been established. And it's important to know that these standards, they do not define technical specification, but they describe a panel testing procedure the packaging must pass. And here's just, so just mentioned some of them. So we have, for example, ISO 8317. This is an international standard for reclosable child resistant packaging. We have ISO 14375, a standard for non-reclosable child resistant packaging for pharmaceutical products. Or for example, in the United States, we have published by the CPSC, Consumer Product Safety Commission, testing requirements according to US 16 CFR paragraph 1700, also known um, as Poison Prevention Packaging Act. This provides you also with a testing procedure for both reclosable and non-reclosable child-resistant packages. So how do these testing procedures work? We as IBM organize these testings and child care facilities, kindergartens, schools, etc. And the standards, like I've mentioned ISO 217 or for example 4375 or US testing procedures, they always consist of two parts. One part is a child panel testing, and this works with a group of 200 children that are aged between 42 and 50 months old. And so we go to the kindergarten and the testing procedure with these young children goes like that. In the first step, it's explained to the children that today they can try and open a package that should actually be too difficult for children to open. They are also given the information that today the package just has a harmless content. So normally we work uh, with packages filled with water or, for example, placebo pills or granules. After this, the children, they are given five minutes where they can try and open the package. After this time, they can watch an adult of how they open the package, but there's no further explanation given to them. And then the children, they have finally another five minutes where they can try and access the package. So once these testings with children have been conducted, we have a pass-fail criteria for uh, the testing group. And um, it is allowed within the first five minutes, not more than 15% of the children shall be able to get access to the package. And for the full testing duration of 10 minutes, there's an allowed maximum of 20% of the children that may be able to open the package. Um, as I told you before, we normally, so it, it works with a group of 200 children, but this is quite a lot. And the standards, they also describe a procedure called sequential testing that allows you to reduce the number of participating children. So if of a certain number of children, we only have very few children that are able to open it or none, then it's possible to reduce the number of children. And this is for example, for ISO 8317, this is 30 kids as if none of the children has opened the package or according to US testing procedures, we have 50 kids. Mm. Second part of the standard testing procedures is a senior adult panel testing. And within this testing procedure, we use a group of senior adults aged from 50 to 70 years old. It's always 100 participants and 70% of them are female. And within this procedure, we have uh, at the beginning, so the, they were told that today the people they can try and open a child resistant packaging they also receive a written instruction to help them. And then the, the seniors have five minutes time to make themselves familiar with the package and then they can try and open it. If they're successful in doing that, 
they get a second package and they are to, to open it and reclose it. And then they only have one minute given for that. So, and this group is now 100 seniors. And after this has been done, we check as a pass fail criteria by standard that at least 90% of the seniors, they have to be able to open the package in the first attempt successfully and then also in the second attempt successfully. So minimum is 90% of the participants. And maybe just to mention some things or some aspects with regard to senior friendliness within CR testing. So of course, it's of great importance that adults can open child resistant packages. They shall be able to open them, get access to the product, maybe medicine, pharmaceuticals, and they also so should be able to reclose them properly again. Just imagine a bottle that would be too difficult for seniors to reclose it afterwards. Children might find it in the household and if it's not properly reclosed, it will probably be very easy for the children to open this. And then if we regard um, the age group of the seniors that will be tested within the testing procedure, it's from 50 to 70 years old. But obviously we can say that if it's, if it's uh, acceptable, so if it's suitable for seniors from 50 to 70 years old, it will be also fine for younger adults. Child uh, resistance testing, and um, if we regard senior friendliness, this does not really mean that the package is in particular easy for adults to open. So we are aware of the fact that sometimes it's a bit tricky to do so. Uh, however, you always have to find the balance between the CR function and of course also the senior friendly aspect. And then an additional, uh, mm, thing or additional aspect is that within senior testing groups, those people that have problems in opening normal non-child resistant packages, those people will be excluded from the uh, senior testing through a screening process. Fine. So once both testings have been organized, Child panel testing and senior panel testing, we check the results. And it's of importance that only those packages that are positive for both testings, child test and senior test, if they have a pass for both testings, we can certify them as child resistant according to the standards. So it's not sufficient only to pass the child panel testing part. And if you fail within the senior testings, it's not according to the standard. It cannot be certified. Um, and finally, I have some, some remarks for, uh, with regards to the testing of non-reclosable child-resistant packages, so-called unit dose packages. Within uh, the ISO 14375, um, the testing with tablet blisters, for example, um, so each participating child has to remove more than eight units from the package to be counted or to be defined as an opening. So this, is, um, this means if the child only gets access to fewer amount of tablets, like three or four, this will not be counted as an opening of the pack. And in contrast to this, we have testing rules according to US testing procedures where the this approach is toxicity linked. So you always have to check the individual packed product, how harmful is the dose for a child of 25 pounds. And by this you define how many tablets are harmful. And this will be used within the analysis of the child testing. So if one tablet is harmful, then this will define an opening. And if it's more, then you can use a higher number of tablets, for example, two, three, uh, four, or more. Yeah, this has to be taken into consideration when we think of blister packs. So thank you for your time listening to me. And I will give back to Nick. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, so guys, we're going to open out for a Q&A now. 
Um, so just a reminder for everyone, in order to ask any questions, and if you want to get any questions in now, you can just send them in via the top right questions widget. Just type them in the box and then click submit. So we've got a good amount of questions here. Um, the first one being, is there any different regulation in Europe and the US for child resistance packaging brackets for the same molecule? Um, shall, I, shall I reply, Nick? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. We, we have we have different regulations, so we have different testing procedure. They differ a bit. So as I told in the beginning, we have ISO 8317 or ISO 14375 as testing standards within Europe, and we have um, slightly different rules in the US. But um, then we have also different regulations to, uh, with respect to the products that have to be packed child resistant. So we have common rules in the US, while in Europe we only have um, individual rules in uh, the member states of the EU. So we have slight, there are slightly differences yeah, with regards to testing and also uh, to the products. Yes. Sure. Um, here we have a, another question, Rolf. Um, are there any CRP considerations for children over four years old? And is there a reason why this has been cut off point? So, sorry, uh, can you repeat? Oh. Yeah, no worries. Um, so, someone asks, are there any CRP considerations for children over four years old? And is there a reason why four years old is the cut off point? No, okay, I see. No, so um, these these rules we have for for hazardous products, either chemicals or pharmaceutical products, for example, they only ask for the usage of child resistant packages, how they are defined within the testing standards. The testing standards they always work this is with a testing group from 42 to 51 months old. The reason behind of this is that most of the intoxication cases happen with very young children under four years old. And for those children, it's helpful to use child-resistant packages. So child-resistant packages, they are not designed to prevent uh, yeah, pupils like, or, or children that go to school, for example. They would be able to access them. So when we think of child-resistant packaging concepts, it's always for children under four years old. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, so there is a question for Anne just come through. Um, do you see the additional or the addition slash change to CRSF packaging as an additional cost that drug manufacturers need to consider? Um, so, so, so I guess the simple answer is yes. I mean, if you're if you're adding, you know, if you talk about oral solid dose blisters, so if you take uh, an oral solid dose blister and you uh, adding materials to that blister, then ultimately the, the, the cost is likely to increase. Um, if you're changing from a simple um, aluminium roll-on pil pilfer-proof cap to a more complex, maybe two or three-piece child-resistant cap, then again, yes, the likelihood is that the component cost would increase. But having said that, the, the cost of that component compared with the cost of the product tends to be uh, minimal. So, so in our you know, in, in simple answer, the answer is yes. Sure, sure, perfect. Um, so, uh, another question: Do you offer help with the selection and decision making of CRP? Yeah, Nick, this question is for me, right? Um, yeah, so so mm -hmm. IBM offers. I offer support uh, if a company has to decide, uh, for example, what kind of child resistant packaging they would, should make their choice for, or if they have to make their choice for specific components like foils, for example. Yes, so, so um, IBM can support you to help you within this decision making. Yep. Fantastic. Um, and I think this is another one for you, Rolf. Um, for a CR testing study, what does the customer have to provide? Yeah, of course. So if we think of uh, testing bottles and socials, for example, we always ask 
for a number of some hundred empty bottles that have to be sent to us. Um, if we think of blisters or unit dose packaging, these packages have to be filled with something. And so normally when we think of blisters, it's placebo filled blisters for some sachets or pouches. We, we can either test them empty or filled with sugar, for example. Yeah, but it's always a number of couple of hundred samples to be sent and more over this specification data, drawings, et cetera, of the packages to prepare the final testing reports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, and there's another one just come for you, Rolf. Um, are there any tests that consider disabled adults under the test criteria? Um, do we assume that if a package is deemed senior friendly, disabled patients will be able to access that as well? No. So um, uh, if if child resistant testings are to be organized and uh, the senior adults that take a part, um, as I as I told before, they are not disabled people. Yeah, it will be checked that they can um, handle normal packages. And there's also a screening procedure that only healthy people will take a part in this. So um, the packages are not so friendly from their design. Um, yeah, to to help to, to help those people also to get access to, they probably will have trouble with that. Sure, sure, okay. Um, and we had a, another question come through about EU regulations. So, um, in Europe, the regulatory body accepts CR slash SS certifications from the bottle slash foil suppliers, but in the US, the end user has to carry out tests and get the CR slash SF certification. Is that correct? So, uh, according to my experience, situation is more or less the same. So, um, we have testing institutes in Europe that conduct these testing according to the standard, and the same goes for the US. So, from no, I, I don't know about the differences there. So, so, so maybe I can help with, with this one. I, I guess the answer to this is is, is no. Uh, you mm -hmm. think. Child resistant closure from a supplier. You know, if, if the supplier sells you a child resistant closure, that becomes a child resistant closure in combination with the bottle. So it, you need to test the bottle and closure combination. Now, now if a, if you buy the bottle and closure from a supplier and they have had it tested and, you, and it's certificate and certified, then yes, that would be considered. Child resistant, uh, but you cannot buy a closure and claim child resistance and then just put it onto any bottle. And likewise, okay. and, and, and just Sorry. if I may add something on that, uh, yep. just to confirm Andrew's point on that, this is what we do also at uh, SGD Pharma is that we make the certification of the full packaging solution of the bottle and the accessories. So and 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 then we can provide uh, all the certificate behind. So yes, it's possible. Whether it is in Europe or in US. Sure. Yeah, maybe sure. just um, to add if, if the question goes to direction, if only parts of the package can be tested or certified, no. So oh, in Europe and also in the US, we test and certify complete packages, whether it's bottles connected with closures or if it's, for example, blisters that are completely manufactured. Um, of different foils, so it's not just one type of foil, yeah? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, so another question to do with uh, CR testing. Um, someone asked, how long does CR testing and certification study take? So so we at IBM, it normally uh, takes us uh, three to four weeks once we have uh, received the sample shipment. We we have to take into consideration that recruiting, especially the children within kindergartens, yeah, that takes quite a lot of time. So it's uh, lots of dates to be organized in different locations, and that's why it takes around three to four weeks. In parallel, we do an organized testings with seniors in shopping centers, for example. Sure, sure. Um, and I, I guess another person has asked kind of something along this line. Um, with regard to the COVID-19 situation, are you guys currently able to offer the CR testings? Um, 
Uh, the answer is yes. Again, now uh, we are you're, we are able to f to operate and run these testings uh, again. We had some delays last year in the second quarter and also beginning of this year, but now the situation has relaxed and we can provide our customers with the normal delivery times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, so we have a, a question that's come through um, that asks, so um, for the protection of the environment, glass bottles with a CR plastic cap would be better than a blister for tablets. Blisters consist of different materials that cannot easily be separated for recycling. Um, what are your thoughts on that, guys? Um, I, I, I'm guessing that's come from, <laughs> from a, a, a glass manufacturing <laughs> supplier. In all honesty, they're probably um sustainability uh, and the impact on the environment is obviously a huge topic uh, globally and um i think it's very difficult to say that um, a glass bottle is, is greener than a blister without doing that full analysis it will depend on the um on the blister material itself um, if you took a cold form blister for instance an alu alu blister Alu, alu blisters are considered to be technically recyclable because of the amount of aluminium content in them. So it, 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 it's a tough one to answer, but it's one that kind of would you would need to do a, a deep deep dive, a, a more detailed analysis on. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, fantastic. Um, we had another question about blisters themselves. So. Someone asks, um, if we're talking about the blister, the layout may vary from one pharma company to another. So does it mean that each pharma company will have to carry out CR certification um, in addition to also the bottle or blister foil supplier? Uh, well, the, bl the, the blister probably, they, may well have, they will have probably tested it on, the, on their own pack design, yes. But the answer to that again is yes, uh, you need to test each blister design because the size of tablet, the base material and the geometry of the uh, pockets and everything does have an impact on um, on how that performs. So each blister design does need to be evaluated. Sure, sure. And um, we, we have a final question, guys. Um, so what are the costs of a CR test according to the various international standards? So yeah, so um, so I can only answer this for IBM, but normally testing of child resistant packages, including certification on all these testing studies, are around nine ten thousand euros, and I think the pricing is comparable with most of the institutes that offer these services. Okay, fantastic, fantastic guys. Um, so, looks like um, many of the questions and answers now. So, it's just over to me um, to say thank you very much for a fantastic presentation, guys. Um, I'm afraid that that's, that's kind of all the time we have for today. Um, if you didn't get your question answered or you've just popped a question in, um, I'm sure um, Najat, Rolf, and Andrew will be available to answer the question in the coming days. Um, so yeah, it leaves me to thank um, you guys, Najat, Rolf and Andrew for a fantastic presentation um, and obviously to SGD Pharma for sponsoring the session. Um, to everyone who attended, you will receive an email shortly um, telling you about how you can access the on-demand version of this if you ever want to view it again, um, or you can even access the on-demand version via, uh, via our website, which is www.business-review-webinars.com. Um, yeah, and we look forward to sharing our, our further webinars with you. So please remind, uh, remember to keep an eye out on the website just mentioned, and also feel free to follow us on our Twitter, which is at VR Webinars, um, and that will be daily updates. And we also have a LinkedIn group, which is called Business Review Webinars. So guys, um, thank you to the speakers once again, and to the attendees. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you Cheers. very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.